Hey, this is Mr. Wistar. In this lesson, which is the first of a two-part video series, actually, we're going to talk about how to write code for implementing our own linked lists. And while you might think that this isn't really necessary because there's already a class, uh, linked list class built into Java, it's a really useful exercise because it really forces you to understand what's actually going on. Uh, if you don't have some experience creating your own linked list class, then it's all going to be kind of a mystery and you won't understand it very well. So we're going to talk about what exactly is going on structurally inside of a linked list, and then we'll take a look at how to write some of the most basic methods that uh, you would see in any linked list class. And just to um, put this in your mind, one thing that you should know is that the code for all of this linked list stuff that we're going to do in both parts is right in your book. So that's why I haven't included it specifically here. I would encourage you to take a look at it there. It uh, covers all of the syntax that you might need to know. So just to review, um, we're talking about linked lists. Linked list, just like an array, is a linear data structure. It's homogeneous, uh, but unlike an array, it's non-contiguous. The elements in a linked list are not necessarily stored in consecutive positions in memory. In fact, what they are actually, which we're going to learn a lot more about in this lesson, is that they are connected to each other like the cars in a subway or a train. When we actually take a look at the implementation of a linked list, we see that every item in a linked list is actually composed of something called a node. And if you think about our train example, the node is like the car of the train. And the data is like the people inside the train car. So every node in a linked list consists of two parts, uh, at least two parts. It has a variable to hold the data stored inside that node. And it also has a variable of type node, which actually points to the next node in the list. Remember we said that the, um, the, the items in a linked list were connected to, to each other like train cars with that coupling, and that's what that node pointer is for. It might look a little strange for you to see a class that contains an object of its own class inside of it, but that's perfectly normal for a node class, and that's how it works. You'll see here in this slide there's a third bullet point which includes optionally, um, if you're making what's called a doubly linked list, each node can actually have a pointer not just to the next node, but it can also have a pointer to the previous node. The way that this usually manifests itself in syntax is using something like this. We actually create something called a private inner class, and that means two things. One is that, unlike most classes, we actually begin it with the word private class instead of public class. And it's an inner class because we actually take this syntax that you see here and we put it inside of our linked list. So we have a class inside of a class. And the reason why we do that is that the node class is its just part of a linked list. We're not going to go and create nodes for use in other programs. Um, we're just going to use them inside of our linked list. And that's what an inner class lets us do. Notice that the fields here in this node class are public. Uh, we're not going to have any methods in this list node class. Um, we're just going to access the data directly. Now, how does that get incorporated into a larger linked list? Well, a linked list, as its name suggests, is a whole bunch of nodes that are linked together. They're connected to each other like a chain, like you see in the picture here. And in our linked list class specifically, we're only going to have a variable that points to the first node in the list. Because if you think about the way that this chain works, as long as our link list has a pointer to the first node in the list, and the first node has a pointer to the second node in the list, and so on and so on and so forth, all you need to be able to do to access every node in a link list is to be able to access the first node in the list. It's like getting in the locomotive of a train and just walking your way through um, all of the cars in order to get to the back of the train. So what that's going to look like is something like this. So here we have inside of our linked list, we have our node object to point to the first node in the list. 
We have a bunch of methods, which we'll get to in a little bit. And then we have that private class. So if you remember back to this class here, this is what we would be including down at the bottom there where it says see previous slide. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how to implement some of those more common link list class methods. And we'll start with the add method for adding things to the front of a list. Uh, again, when you're working with linked lists and with data structures in general, drawing pictures is essential. You can find pictures in your book, so I haven't reproduced them here. And honestly, I would highly recommend that you draw them out by hand, that you literally draw a diagram, go step by step, draw the changes that get made so that you can see visually what is changing in your data structure. But if we take a look at the pseudocode here, here's what has to happen. The first thing for adding a node to the list is you have to create the nodes. You have to create a node object. Um, you have to take the data. You have to put it in the node. And then you actually get to um, what is a very common programming pattern with linked list methods, which is you have to have a special case for when the list is empty. And in this case, we say if the list is empty, um, then we don't really have any extra work to do. If the list is not empty, then what we have to do is we have to take our new node and we have to make its next pointer point to the first node in the list right now. Because remember, we're adding a new node to the front of the list. The new node is going to become the front of the list. And so it has to point at the current front of the list because that node has now become node number two. So we take the new node, we point it at the first node, and then what we do is we take our um, list pointer first and we reassign it so it points to that new node. So now our list points to the new node as the front of the list. How about getting the first node in the list? That's a lot simpler actually. There's not much that we have to do. But I want you to point out something to you that's here in the syntax in your book and it's here in our pseudocode here. Um, if the list is empty, if you try to access the first node in a list, we're not just going to return null. And the reason why we're not going to just return null is that that's a valid thing to put in our linked list. For whatever reason, you might want to have null as the data value for your node. So that doesn't necessarily signify that something has gone wrong. What we're actually going to do is we're going to do something called throwing an exception. If you've ever seen your program crash, for example, you've seen exceptions that were thrown by Java. And now it's time for you to start throwing your own exceptions. Take a look in your book. You'll see the syntax for that. It's fine with me if you just copy that syntax. Essentially what you're doing is you are triggering a catastrophe. And it's going to be up to whoever uses your class to anticipate that and handle it um, in order for your program to work properly. And if they don't, then their program is going to crash, which is probably what should happen if you try to touch uh, the no a node in your linked list that doesn't actually exist. But assuming that that's okay, then all we have to do is just return the data field of our first pointer. So that's pretty easy. Um, removing the first node in our list is a little more complicated than adding, but it's not that complicated. Take a look at, again at the diagram in your book because it shows you what has to happen and it shows you what steps, what order those steps have to happen. And that's really important. If you mess up the order of your steps, a lot of times you end up breaking your list. Um, again, just like with get, Remember in get, if the list is empty, we have to throw an exception. With remove, if the list is empty, we should throw an exception. You can't remove a node that doesn't exist, so you need to throw an exception in that case and make somebody handle that. Assuming that your list is not empty, though, what we have to do is a couple things. Remove is supposed to return the thing that it removed. So we can't just delete the node or else we'll lose that data. So we're going to save it first in a temporary variable. Then what we're going to do is we're going to say first gets first.next. And if you think about from a diagram standpoint, what that's going to do is it's just going to say, OK, the first pointer that used to be pointed at node number one is now pointing at node number two. So node number two has now become the new first node in the list, which effectively deletes that first node. Because if you can't access a node in the list, it's like a tree in a forest. If you can't access a node in the list, then it might as well not exist at all. Um, and then the last step is just to return that data since remember that's what we said that the list um, needs to do. Okay, so th this is the end of part one. 
In part two, we will get to writing our iterator code. Um, but just to recap what we did in part one, we talked about sort of the anatomy of a list node and a list in general, and we talked about the pseudocode for adding, um, getting, and removing nodes from or values from the front of our linked list. Notice that we didn't cover those um, corresponding methods for the end of a list, but you're going to get to that when you implement the lab for this unit. All right, go on to part two.